Hello, my name is Lindsay Wyrick, and today I'm going to show you how to use Derwent Inktense pencils to create this beautiful still life using the technique Grisaille. Grisaille is an old master's technique where we do a black and white underpainting and then cover over it with gorgeous, luminous, bright color. Let's go to the table and I'll show you how it's done. In this lesson, we are going to do an underpainting in grisaille, which is a grayscale method that the old masters used to use underneath their oil paintings to give it a really um, authentic and realistic look. So what I've done here to make it easy is I've taken my reference photo and actually printed it out in black and white and in color. As you gain experience with painting, you won't need to do this, but this will really help you see the values so you don't get confused by the colors. So I have it here in two versions. Now, of course, you can do this with whatever photo you want to use. Um, you can go out, take your own photograph, and then print out a version in black and white so you can see those values a little bit easier. I've got it traced onto my uh, my watercolor paper here. I'm using a hot press watercolor paper, but you can use whatever you like. And I have my Derwin Ink Tense Ink Black Pencil. Now, once you add water to the ink tents, it will become permanent. So then I can glaze over it with other colors of ink tents or even watercolors if I want to. So that's why I wanna use this for my underpainting. This would be a handy color to have uh, to do techniques like this under any sort of water media. So um, a really great color to have. We're gonna start off with the background because that's gonna to need to be really dark. And um, I'm gonna use the edge of my pencil and I'm just gonna start layering in a really uniform um, layer of color. Uh, you don't wanna use a lot of pressure here because if you do, then you could end up um, kind of inscribing on the paper and that could give you um, uneven marks. Now because this is intense and we can layer, if it's not dark enough on our first go, we can simply just let it dry and go over again and repeat that step as much as we need. Now as I'm doing this, I'm turning my pencil and that's gonna preserve the point so I won't have to sharpen it too frequently. And then if I wanna go in and add details elsewhere, then I have a nice point. That helps you conserve your materials and also saves time. So proceed with filling up the whole background area with this dark, even tone. Let's talk about brushes for use with ink tents. If I want to keep a color really dark, and um, a lot of times when I'm using watercolor pencils in general or any sort of water soluble media, I want to have a stiffer, less absorbent brush because I don't want to wash away any of this gorgeous pigment. So what I'm going to use here is a synthetic golden tacklon brush. You probably have some of these in your stash. They'll have usually kind of like blonde or tan hairs, but you can even use nylon brushes with white hair. Um, and then when I dip it in my water, I want to try not to get water up on the handle or the ferrule of the brush because I don't want to have drops of water sliding down into my painting as I'm working. Now look at how we get this gorgeous inky effect. I just want to get enough water on here so that I can dilute and lock down those, um, those particles of pigment. I want to use a flat brush because I find that the flat brush helps me um, get a more even coverage and it holds less water. And it also is a little bit stiffer than a round, so it will break up those pigment particles a little bit easier. Now we might get by with just one layer of black in this background, but if when it dries we decide we want it a little bit darker, then we can do that. We can go over it with another, another layer. This is our darkest value. Value simply refers to how dark or how light something is. A lot of people get, get value and hue confused, where hue is the color, value is the lightness or darkness. And value is much more important than color when you're working with art because you can do a portrait of someone and use crazy colors, but if you have the values right and your drawing is accurate, it's gonna look like that person. And you don't even have to be too um, precise with your brush strokes in this layer. Don't worry if it comes out a little streaky because we can go over it. Another tip I'll have, which I won't do too much while I'm filming, is that you can turn your paper so that you are really the most comfortable and you can um, reach every part of your painting in the easiest way for you. 
if you're not working on a watercolor block. And a watercolor block, if you don't know, is just a pad of watercolor paper that's been bound on all four sides. If you're working on like a pad of watercolor or paper, you can tape it down, just peel off that sheet and tape it down to a board or a piece of foam core or a clipboard or something like that so that you can move it around while you're working. It is nice to have your watercolor paper taped down because that way it won't curl on you as you're working. And it gives you this ability to turn it around and hold it up at an angle and, uh, and just be as comfortable as you can while you're working. The background is liquefied. It's not completely dry yet, so it does appear a little streaky. And I think it's gonna need another layer, but for now, we're just gonna let that dry and move on to another portion of the painting. I like to work dark to light, so I'm gonna go to my next dark value, which would be the shadows that are in here. So it's blocking a lot of light. Our light source is coming from this direction. So I'm gonna get these darker values in next. And because I use the side of my pencil, I have a nice sharp area there. And I'm just gonna use very little pressure. Again, I don't wanna scratch up my painting. And I'm gonna color in those areas of shadow. Exercises like this will really help you see the different values. You'll notice that our brightest white is there on the highlight on the vase or the picture, and also this back ledge of the table. We have our darker areas in the background and in these deeper shadows here, and then everything else is gonna fall in between. So by starting off with the darks and then having the white of your paper, you have the full value range to fit everything else in between. Notice how the shadow is darker back here than it is in this area down through there. So I am not putting as much uh, lead down in here where it's a little bit brighter. And don't pay attention to the blue in the shadow here while you're sketching, but you will, or while you're shading and getting your values in, but you will wanna be able to layer some of that blue on top, which is like a, a reflected color from the bowl. Sometimes you end up with, um, you end up with colors in your shadows because the light is actually reflecting off the object and bouncing into the shadow. So I'm gonna add this shadow here and I'm gonna start applying my, um, my other values here. Now, if I look on the uh, the bowl, I'll see this little ridge here is actually lighter. It's getting some highlights some bounced light off the table, and it's also, there's some bounced light there. So I'm gonna keep that in mind as I am going in and adding more shadows. This is going to be a little bit lighter than the, uh, the shadow on the table, especially on this side of the stem of that bowl. And if you find yourself getting confused, stop and liquefy what, what you've already done. But if you don't find it confusing at all and you can see your original sketched lines, then you can keep on um, shading and liquefying it all at once. I don't think anything's gonna need another layer except for the background, so um, I think you'll be all right there. Now, if we look at the bowl here, we have got a uh, dark shadow here on this side. and then it lightens up quite a bit. We've got a little bit of a rouging here. It's a little bit darker here on this underside, just for a little while. And I'll be able to spread out some of the shadow throughout the bowl, so I don't want to get too much on at this point and then end up being like, whoa, I really over darkened that because we are going to add color on top. And blue is, is a fairly dark value, so uh, we don't have to color every inch. We can spread some of that color around. There's a really light ridge at the top of this bowl that I'm going to leave light. I'm going to leave uncolored. You kind of see it a little bit easier right there, I think. A lighter, lit red, uh, lighter ridge and then it gets dark. And 
you don't have to worry about your shading, te shading techniques too much as long as you know you're not scratching the paper. Now up here, this edge gets quite dark along the ridge, so I want to put that in. And there's a little bit of shadow in the bowl there, probably cast from that nectarine. And we've got this interior part of the bowl is very dark. We will have a little bit of that uh, reddish peach color in there later on top, but it's, it's going to be very desaturated. Now on the peach itself, we're going to have some shadow on the dented area here, the, the indent. And then we've got a shadow coming along like that. It gets quite a bit darker as it goes around the edge. Nice contrast up against the ridge of the bowl, so make sure you keep that line nice and crisp. Turn your pencil as you go so you don't have to sharpen a lot because we're going to use a lot of this pencil or a lot of this color in this project so we want to make sure that uh, that we don't waste that we don't waste right now if you're going to do this with a regular watercolor pencil you'll run into an issue when you go to glaze over it because regular watercolor pencils lift pretty easily so that's why we're using the ink tent because the ink tents does not. So just a little bit of shadow on that one. And then over here, our shadow has a really interesting shape. It goes, we've got this curved shape. It's a shadow that this nectarine is, nectarine is casting on this. Then we've got this shape here, which is the, the, the uh, shadow from this form itself. And again, if you want to turn your paper so that you can be scooching right up against that edge, that's what I like to do. If I know I have an edge I want to keep sharp, I turn my paper so I can scooch right up against it. And that really helps. And we're just going to fill in up to that, that line that we made. I like to put my darks in first and then work, work towards the light because um, I find that a lot of times my students are really timid when they're going to put their shadows. So if I can get them to start off a little darker and get those kind of brave shadows in first, it's a lot easier. Now, there is a shadow on this vase. However, if I look here at the bowl versus the vase, even like, even with the shadow on that, the base color, the local color of this bowl is darker. Like if you look at this and you squint, if you look at your photo and you squint, you'll see that actually these values are very close. This highlight on this bowl and the uh, shadow on this vase, but the bowl is just a smidgen darker. So I've got to put a little bit of toning in there. Not a lot, but just a little bit. We're going to have that blue anyway. So I'm going to have to have just a little bit in there. And then the shadow on this part of the vase is actually darker than the tone, the local color of this bowl. It's not as dark as the shadow inside this bowl, but when going up against this edge here, this is going to be darker. And there's also a really interesting shadow. It's kind of, Unfortunately, it's kind of just starting and then it gets tucked behind that vase and then it picks up back here and that line comes around. It's this line right there. Really light pressure. This is so light, but it's so interesting and it helps carve the edge. Now you notice that edge right there is not really sharp because it's getting lost in the shadow. We've got a shadow on that side and then we've got the darkness of the cast shadow. So it kind of puts that out of focus a little bit. So I'm just doing a very, very, as light as I can toning there. And if you get too dark and you're liquefying this and you're like, oh no, I got a little too dark with that, don't fret because you can 
um, you can blot it with a paper towel or just take it like rinse your brush off and go in there with a blotted off brush and pick off that color so if you end up getting a little too much somewhere it's not the end of the world it's totally fixable and nothing is a failure when you're doing art because even if it doesn't work out you're learning you're learning about what does work and what doesn't work and um, I think that's all that's all a win and then we get this really cool shadow from the edge of that spout and it just kind of curves around like that I think that looks so interesting we're gonna fill that in um, and that is gonna go all the way this is also in shadow all the way up here to the edge when you get the thickness of the um, of pictures and stuff you just want to be aware of that so you do leave that little sliver of highlight where you're seeing the edge now this plane is going to be a little bit darker than this plane here and that's going to help that look like it's popping out if you have a, like a white statue or a bunch of white pottery or something you can set up in a still life that's really nice to draw and shade because you've taken out the color and then you can set up different lighting scenarios and really have fun with uh, with learning values that way too so there would that would be something really fun to draw to try if you want to go through your cupboards and find some cool mugs and vases and things like that now there is a really bright highlight right there and what that's coming from is this is a fairly not really that glossy but it's ref reflective enough that the light coming in this way is bouncing off of that interior part of the handle that's why that's all bright and it's it's reflecting onto this edge so we actually have a really fun really bright highlight just a sliver of a bright highlight there so we want to make sure that we don't cover that up I am leaving it a little bit exaggerated and wider here because I know I can push that over with my brush it's better to leave a little too much than not enough because you know you can always drag that color over or apply some more and I'm just gonna finish filling in this I'm using a hot press paper because um, see all the grain that we're seeing I wanted less grain I like this hot press paper because it's not super slick some hot press papers are almost like cardstock they're so slick and I don't care for that personally but you can use that for sure you can use whatever you like you could use Bristol I probably um, you could use a smooth or a vellum finish Bristol for this I find that these pencils do work really well in Bristol and Bristol is much more affordable especially if you're practicing and you're you know you just want to have an inexpensive paper that's still going to perform pretty well and mixed media paper also would work pretty well oh I love this I don't have any grime on my hands I was worried I was resting my hands like that but it's like it's ink tense it's magic it's not gonna it's not gonna bleed on my hands and then this shadow is fairly dark so I'm gonna fill that in and we're getting that I like I like interesting shadow shapes and then on the inside of this we don't have a huge shadow on the inside here and we do have that little bit of a ridge at the top that we want to remain light now if you are using ink tents and you're like oh no I went too far with the shadow and I've liquefied it and it's all um, it's all too dark you could always go in with like a white gouache or something like that to give you that white back and in ink tents actually and the block in the pan paint version of ink tents is a little bit more opaque they actually have a white um, antique white ink tents pan paint and block that work really well for getting those um for bringing those whites back it's very opaque now i think i didn't come down quite far enough in the background so i'm going to adjust that right now and i'll just need to and i think that's a little too high there i'll just need to reliquify that when i do my next layer on the background not a big deal i'm not sure if i have this dark enough to be honest but that's a great thing about Intense is that we can keep layering until we have it just right. Now this uh, bowl itself is darker than the 
than the table. So I'm just going to go ahead and get, I think I want to darken that a little bit more. You can do this in a couple steps. You don't have to do this all at once, but I figure while I'm at it, I'm just going to go ahead and darken that up a little bit because I have a feeling I'm going to have to go in and add a little bit more to this because it is darker than the tablecloth and than that picture. So, so I'm just adjusting now and saving myself the trouble, right? All right, now I'm looking for any other areas on the tablecloth where I might have a bit of shadow and I have a little one over here. Oftentimes with still life, you'll have multiple light sources. Like you might have a lamp that's illuminating the still life, but there also might be light coming in from a window. Um, or you may have an, like a lamp and then an overhead light. I know where I film in my studio, I have four lights that point to my table. So if I have like a little knickknack or vase or something I'm drawing, um, I'll usually have one main light that I'll try to take most of my shadow cues from, but often, you know, there'll be a few lights. And I think that's pretty typical when you have a still life set up, especially if it's like maybe a, a grouping of veggies and pottery in the kitchen. You're, you're probably going to have a few different, different um, sources of ambient light. So it's just something to keep in mind. And then last thing we're going to do here is we are going to give another layer to the background since we... Since we have it, it's all dry now. So if you're not sure if it's dry or not, what you can do is like touch the back of your hand or like this part here of your hand onto the paper. And if it feels cool to the touch, then it's not dry yet. You want to give it some more time or you want to blast it with a hair dryer or a heat tool or something. But if that feels room temperature, you are good to go with another layer. You don't need to be as precise with this second layer. Um, you just want to give it another layer and that's really going to even it out. You could even do it again if you needed to, so try not to fret too much. And uh, we'll be back when we start to add our next layer of water to lock everything down. All right, let's go ahead and start liquefying again. I'm going to go in with my flat brush and I am going to try to keep my strokes fairly even just to uh, just to avoid any streakiness. And I'm going to begin just by liquefying the background. The next thing we're going to do is liquefy the shadows under the objects here on the table. And I'm going to use a filbert. And a filbert has the benefit of having a flat ferrule, so it's fairly stiff and pushes your paint really well, or your it, you know, it uh, re dissolves the pigments really well, but it's got a rounded edge, so it gives you kind of a little bit more control like a round brush would without um, without having too much water. So I'm just going to go in there, starting with my darkest areas, and we'll go find those shadows. Again, move your painting around. if you want. Don't worry about any streakiness because it will, it'll uh, even out. I don't think we'll need a second layer on these shadows. I think it's just that background. But look how gorgeous and matte it is now that it's, um, now that it's liquefied. And you can go in with a smaller brush even if you want to, but I find smaller brushes create more streaks if you're working in larger areas, so. I try to stick with the largest brush that I can work comfortably with. And that's a good piece of advice, I think, no matter what, is use the largest brush you're comfortable with. I'm clean my brush off, actually, at this point and blot it because I know I want it a little bit lighter here, so I might need to pick up a little of that pigment and spread it a bit. And go over here. You can use your watercolor brushes for ink tents, but just keep in mind that watercolor brushes often are softer, so you might want to have a little bit of a stiffer brush like your brushes you would use for acrylics, your golden tacklons. Now there I am getting a little bit 
into a spot where I feel like this brush is a bit too large, so I'm going to use a small angular brush. Angular brushes are flat brushes that are cut at an angle, and you often can get a little bit more detail that way because you've got that little pointy edge that you can sneak into to different areas. All right, so we've got our uh, our main floor shadows or tabletop shadows done. I am going to take that felbert again though, and um, just kind of dissolve those other little areas because um, I don't want them to completely fade away when we do an overarching wash. And remember, it's a water that helps us lock down the pigment. I know this can look a little sloppy right now. You might be like, how's that going to turn into a beautiful painting? But it's part of the process. I always tell my students that your painting goes through a hot mess stage and that's the point where you're like, oh, how am I going to save this? This looks so awful. Um, but it doesn't stay that way. And you can pick up pigment and you can move it around and that's part of the fun. All right. So now what we're going to do is work on some of the subjects here. I'm going to start with the white, the lighter area, and I'm going to go into the darker portion of it first because I might end up picking up some color and then like kind of uh, toning over here a little bit. So it just kind of makes things easier. It just kind of kills two birds with one stone. As long as you don't let an area completely dry, you can kind of bounce around and come back and, and blend things. You just don't want to have like a, a really harsh streaky area. That looks really dark, doesn't it? <laughs> the scarily dark. Bring some of that over here where I see a little bit of uh, darkness. And it does dry a little bit lighter, so don't freak out if you're if you're um, adding water and you're like, oh no, it's I got it way too dark. Whenever your paper is wet like that, it will look darker than how it's really going to turn out. So try not to worry about that too much. Any areas where you have a softer edge, you can go in and kind of uh, blur it a little bit. And let me soften that edge a little bit too. And then we've got this coming out like that. This brush is probably a little big for this area, so I'm going to switch to that um, that angle brush again. I'm going to turn it around so I can get into this little spout area a little bit better. Just kind of fade it. Fade it out a little bit, go back in with a clean wet brush and just kind of scrub it back a little bit. I feel like that shadow should be over just a little bit more. And you might get some streaky effects, but don't worry about it. We still are going to glaze over with color. I mean, do your best to get keep it pretty smooth, but don't... Um, Don't worry about it too much because this is not a photograph, it's a painting. 
All right, I feel like that does seem a little strong, but I think maybe I just need to, uh, <clears throat> just need to maybe tone a little bit. Let me pick up a little bit of that color if I can. And just kind of bring it over here. That's probably a little too harsh, but well, it's there now. Let's Another thing you can do is if you need a little bit of color, you can take the, your uh, brush, you can pick up some pigment from the tip. Now this is really actually, if you have the ink tense blocks, which is like a pastel stick of this material, you can, you know, just wet it like a pan of watercolor, or you can use the ink tense pans for the same, um, for the same technique and just kind of go in there and and paint on it just like you would like a, a pan of watercolor. I do that quite a bit. I want to kind of fade it out into that highlight. Look, I got my highlight over a little too much though. All right, we're just going to let that dry and we'll see what it looks like when we come back to it, but I think it's going to be fine. I know that on the neck it's really strong, but I, but it really is, so. On this, I'm actually going to start in here on the lighter side and work towards the dark. See how it gets darker in there where I put more pressure? I think that's going to help me get a better blend. And I think I will just grab this brush. It's clean and damp and just kind of go over that edge. I think I did miss a little smidgen on the lighter base, but I'm gonna leave that be for right now. And actually the flat brush might be a little bit better. Getting in on this bowl, because I have so much space here. The Intense pencils, especially this, um, this ink black and, and doing this technique is really nice for students that are getting, going from drawing to going to working with color and painting. I know it's it can be a very difficult transition for a lot of students that I've had, especially um, boys around the age of um, 10 to 14, they get so much confidence in their, their drawing skills, their black and white drawing skills, that when they switch over to painting, it's kind of like you've got that learning curve again and you kind of get knocked a couple pegs back on the ladder. So having something that's kind of a natural bridge from drawing to painting can really be helpful. And still, you're gonna have those messy, hot mess stages, but you start off with something familiar, you know, shading with a pencil. That's very familiar to a lot of students. And it, it I think it can make things a little bit more um, natural and it, you know, just makes sense a lot more for students. And why make it harder for them, right? Especially if you can transition what you know from drawing over into painting. It gives you a little step stool. If you need to go in with a darker value and put another layer on, there's nothing wrong with that. So um, when in doubt, you can let it dry and you can layer on more after. I'm going in with a small angle brush to start adding some of the shadows on the nectarine. The shadows here on the side are almost, they're almost black, so. We do want to be careful we don't get them lost into the background though. We've got to make sure we have enough light that we'll be able to put our our color on top and it will be noticeable. And just to reiterate, it's very important you let the layers dry before you go and put the color on top or you're going to end up with some mud, which would be extremely frustrating after all this hard work you've done. 
Now cleaning off the brush here, I'm actually thinking I'm going to switch to the filbert again. And I'm going to do this edge here. Just kind of scrub over it a little bit. I don't want that to be too dark because this isn't so much shadow right here as it well it's a little bit of shadow but a lot of it is just kind of the red of the nectarine. Same up here there is some shadow but it's also happens to be a little bit redder in that area so I don't want to overdo it. I'm just going to kind of spread some of that out. Spread out this edge, soften this edge a little bit. You can give it some texture while I'm at it. I should have left those really bright highlights, but I missed them, so that's a bummer, but I think it'll be fine. All right, then I want to also just kind of clean my brush off, and um, I'm just going to go over this little ridge. I know I would pick up enough just residual ink tents to do that, just to lighten that up a little bit. I mean, um, I'm sorry, to uh, knock back that shadow, that highlight a little bit. There's always like a little grain of, of uh, pigment that we can, that we can grab. And speaking of, I want to get that locked in a bit. Okay, now the last final thing I want to do before we let this dry completely, that's looking pretty good I think, um, is I'm going to just go over the tabletop. I'm going to try to fuzz the back edge a little bit. Just to give it a little bit of toning. Pick up a little bit of... Uh, The color there. And that's also going to help me lock things down so that when we go over with our with our colors in the next step we will have uh, we won't have any black bleeding hopefully. I do like to rinse my brush often while I'm doing this though just in case I do find some area that I haven't liquefied very well. I don't end up overdoing it and contaminating anything too badly. But it does lock down pretty good. All right. So at this point you want it to dry completely. So that means use a hair dryer or just let it sit. Make sure all of that pigment gets uh, gets locked down. So if you don't dissolve the ink tents, it's going to reactivate. That's the key with ink tents. And um, when you apply it really thickly, like we did in the background, it's really important. I think going in a couple layers is actually good for that situation because then you know you've you've um, you have dissolved everything and made it permanent. So we'll see you in the next clip after this is dry and we'll start applying some color. Our picture is completely dry, so now we're going to start the adding color to our grisaille underpainting. And I'm starting with this Sun Yellow Inktense Pencil. All the pencils I'm using today can be found in the 12 color set. I can go over the entire base, I can go over the shadows, I can go over everything because the ink tents, the first layer that we dissolved, is permanent. Now the only time I might get some bleeding is if there were some granules of the black that I didn't that I didn't dissolve. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and a, one way to overcome that is if you think you may not have dissolved everything properly, is that do all your lighter areas and then work into your darker areas and that way if you do have any color that didn't get dissolved, um, you won't go spreading it into the lighter areas. 
Now the nice thing about this is that because you took so much care on that first layer, you really don't have to um, be too precious or too careful about doing the second layer. Obviously you want to keep it neat, but as far as like direction, you don't want to scratch the paper with this either, so using the edge will work really well. Again, I recommend turning your pencil as you go so that you always retain that sharp tip until you've just worn it down to a nub and that will conserve your material. Now another thing you could do, if you have the whole um, suite of Inktense products, you could use the Inktense pan paints or the Inktense blocks, just like you would watercolor paint and glaze over this. And if all you had was that ink black, ink tense pencil, you could go over this with regular watercolors as well. So there's a lot of different options that you can use to get the same effect with what you have. You just need to make sure that first layer that you put down is not going to run with your subsequent layers. That's really the only thing you need to worry about with this um, with this product. Now the nice thing about the ink tense is if you decide you want to layer on more later, you can. Like you see we've got this yellow but then we've got this orange, it's being reflected from the nectarines. Um, we may have little smidgens of blue, I don't see too much, but you could have some other colors reflected from other portions. So that's just something to, uh, to think about. I think I'm going to go ahead and add some of that orangey color in here using, I think it's tangerine. Yes, tangerine, adding that into the shadows where I see it. But if, you're, if this makes you nervous, you can do that in the next layer. You could go ahead and dilute the red, uh, dilute the orange, the yellow rather, and then you could go in and add some of this color. I even see a little bit of this inside the picture itself. So I'll just need to be careful when I go to activate these colors that I, you know, I don't want to just slip, slap, slip, slap. I want to do the light areas and maybe even um, rinse my brush and then move into an area with orange. I don't want to spread that everywhere. I could probably even add a little of the poppy red in there as well. This is a really good starter set because you have so many variety, so many good, a good variety of color and so many colors that can be mixed together that um, because it's a water soluble media, it's going to blend really well and you can, um, you know, you can, you can mix it well and create all the colors that you might want. I don't want that round brush. I think I'm going to go for my filbert again. I'm going to start here in the lightest area. Now looking at that, I'm thinking, hmm, I'd like to warm that up a little bit. So what I can do is I can take my orange and right off the tip of the pencil and put it on my palette and get a little bit of an orange wash to add into that because I was thinking that that yellow looked a little bit too lemony to me. And so that way I can kind of warm it up a little bit. I can still keep it light in the center. But I can add that uh, the undertone that I that I feel there. And look at that. Our dark color is not lifting up underneath, which is nice. We're getting a gorgeous effect. Still, it doesn't hurt to, you know, blot your brush, rinse your brush off and, and dab it every once in a while if you're concerned. But the colors mix so well that if your color's not just right the way it comes off the pencil, just do the palette technique. You can use any dish that you have in your stash at home for that. It doesn't have to be a palette per se. It doesn't have to be an artist's palette. Now, because I'm working in the shadow area, I'm just going to stick into this area for right now by itself. Just in case I missed dissolving an area, I'm not going to be dragging any of the, uh, the darker color elsewhere. Where it was overlapping the background, I decided I would rinse again just, just to be safe. Because sometimes those edges, you get two edges next to each other, you might not be brave and go in there and dissolve it all the way. It doesn't hurt to take your time. It doesn't cost you anything. Just maybe a little bit of time. I 
go back over to this highlighted area. I feel like that needs a little bit more orange to it, so I'm going to pick that off my palette. And get this area as well. So that is the basic principle of how we are going to glaze over here. I might go and add another layer of color after it's dry if I see that I need some other colors, but that's pretty much it. So um, we can move on to the nectarines next because that's a little bit more complex. I'm going to start with some yellow here, right? I can see I've got a little bit more yellow in this portion of the fruit, maybe just a little bit here, not too much. And I've got some back here. Then I'm going to go in with the orange. Now the orange is more, is much stronger, much more saturated. I'm going to kind of work my way up. You'll have the orange in on the shadow areas as well. It's going to be a lot more saturated too once we go in and we add the water. So. Keep that in mind. Try not to dig into the paper. Use the edge like I'm doing here unless you need really strong detail for something, which we might as we go on, but right now we're just blocking in color. And then I'm going to do the poppy red because these nectarines have a lot of red, especially in the shadows. So I'm going to go in and add that in through here. And back here we have quite a bit of that red on this nectarine and back. We can see it there. And a little bit here in the front. A little bit back here on this one and back to separate the two. All right, and remember we can always, like if you're thinking that, oh, maybe I don't have enough orange in there or enough yellow, you can you know, layer up a little bit more before you um, add on. Now, try to get all the color you need or what you think you're going to need on this dry layer because once you add your water, you're going to want to let them dry before you go over with more unless you want to add it wet from the tip of the, like off your, off your paintbrush or um, unless you want to let it dry and then go in after it. Pay attention to the edges. You really don't want to overlap into the um, into the blue because that will really show up. And you can use a smaller brush if you want to. It's it's up to you. Whatever you're comfortable with. After doing that red, I'm going to rinse my brush off, blot off the excess. You don't want too much water because, like I mentioned before, you could end up rinsing out the color that you're trying to achieve. Now I like the, the technique of putting the black down, letting it dry, and then glazing over with color because you don't get muddiness. When you glaze over, you, you don't get that um, sludgy look that you might get otherwise. Now I do want to add some more color. So if you had the, like I said, the ink tents, blocks, or pan paints, you could pick it up like that or use the tip of your pencil, like a pan paint. I noticed these resist blooming quite a bit, so if you are going in and doing this technique, you shouldn't end up with a big cauliflower in your work. Now when you have a wet surface, I'm going to show you another technique you can do, which is really nice when you're trying to get pattern and texture or something. And what we're going to do, I have a little bit more red in there because I see that it's darker. Um, we're going to do a little bit of direct to wet paper. So when you do this, you can put in designs like there's a very, very faint type of, a, you can do stippling. And that wet surface is going to grab the 
the um, pigment right off the stick really well. And you're going to get that beautiful stickle, uh, stickled, stippled or even stripey texture that you might be going for here. You know, nectarines can have that kind of like a um, striated look. And that can really get a lot of detail done for you without a lot of work. As the paper dries out though, and you're leaving depositing pigment, you will want to go in and reactivate that. Like up here where I'm getting that broken line, I will want to go in with a small brush and reactivate that because I can tell that it didn't all get, um, get activated. I'm just going to do that with that little round brush because I can get right in there. Maybe even add a little bit of yellow. You can also dip your pencil into the water. Make sure you just get the lead. Try not to get the wood because that, that's where you can run into problems with your pencils. If you get them, if you get the wood wet, then the wood can split. So you just want to touch the, uh, the tip only. One way that I have found easy to prevent getting the wood wet is to actually spray some water on your palette and then just dip it onto the palette because that way you're not going to get that deep into the water, so you don't have to worry about it so much. I'm going to go in with some orange. Now I'll have to reassess after it's dry, but I think I may need to go a little bit darker in the bowl. I'm not 100% sure, but um, it seems like I might have to. And now what I'm going to do on the bowl is I'm going to go over it with some sea blue and then liquefy it. So um, what you want to do is just put on a pretty even coating because we have our sh uh, shadowing done already and then we'll just liquefy. After applying the sea blue, I was looking at this bowl and I see a lot of kind of green undertones in there too. So I'm going in with this teal green and I'm adding some of that in as well. That's really, I, I think it's partially the light that's making that teal color come through, but I wanna go put that in there now that I see it. Now something else that I'm noticing is some blue into the shadow here, which we talked about when we were doing the shadow, and I want to go ahead and put that in as well. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. I think I'll use the flat brush for this. And let's see. It can be difficult to tell whether we got it dark enough. but I think it looks pretty good. And I did put quite a bit of water in there because I wanted to try and do this quickly so no edges could dry on me. Oh, we can see a little bit where I didn't fully liquefy my ink there. Sometimes it happens in the really dark shadows. It looks like it's solidly liquefied, but you just colored it really, really, solidly so it uh, so it appears to be liquefied but you really just um, you really just colored it dark so you just want to be careful of that in your shadows that's why I recommend you know kind of skipping around doing your light areas and then doing the dark areas or rinsing your brush after you do the dark areas I'll do the same thing there too Right, I think I will go in with a smaller brush just to get this edge here. I might need to pick up some color from the tip of the of the pencil as well. Here we go. And then I'm going to add um, the water to the shadow and we'll see how that looks. And then we're going to let this layer dry before we proceed and see what else this needs. There's really not much more to this lesson other than finishing up um, little details you might want to add, like maybe some bright highlights. Um, if I would have left the white of the paper there on my first 
pass through. I probably wouldn't be needing the highlights now, but um, I do feel like I do need them. And I think what I'm going to do right now is go through and just um, places where I see that I didn't get the color down. And you might want to go ahead and sharpen your pencils again to get a nice edge for doing that. I want to go in and add that. And I will be liquefying that. And so I'm just basically going to go through and see where I need to just fill in color and deepen my color a bit. When we come back, we'll add a few finishing touches and we'll see how it turned out. I realized something. I think I need a little bit of this fuchsia color in the nectarines because I was noticing kind of a dullness in here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put this in there because it's the fuchsia is like a super cool primary red, almost um, pink leaning. And I think that's really going to help get rid of some of the dullness that I'm getting here on the fruits. And I'm putting that everywhere. I have a shadow everywhere. I, I had put some black originally, and I think that's going to help me kind of get a truer deep color. And I can even add in, mix in some of that turquoise color from the bowl if I need to. Now, another thing I thought would be really cool is actually to have some of that turquoise, or this uh, future rather, future rather, in the tablecloth. But I don't want to have it really strong, so I'm going to go very, very lightly and just kind of add some on that way. And honestly, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of debating with myself whether that's the best thing to do or whether or not I should actually pick up color from the tip of the pencil with my um, with my brush. But uh, if you had the ink tents, that would be a really, or the pan paints, that would be a really good option. I think I can color light enough with this that it won't get too crazy bright. And if it does get too bright, what I can do is I can lift it off while it's still wet. So I'm going to go right over the shadows as well because that color is going to be everywhere. If it's on the tablecloth, it's everywhere because it's, you know, we're going to have that glazing. You paint it one place, you know, it's going to be everywhere. Because we're dealing with transparent colors here. And I'm using a fair amount of water because I want, I don't want it to dry out on me because once it dries, it's permanent, so I want to make sure if I need blending, if I need to do any of that stuff, I have the time to um, to achieve the blend that I want. Nice thing about this, you see how I kind of slurped over the um, the edge of that that bowl because it was the um, ink tense. I didn't have to worry about that color running. Now I am going to be careful in the shadows just to be on the safe side. I'm not going to tempt fate, but uh, that is one of the great things about the ink tents. Oh, I like that color. It's a little bit more intense. I mean, that's just kind of like a really pale lilac color there in the reference photo. It's almost just, it probably was even a white tablecloth, but it's just the lighting makes it look a little purpley. But I think that this looks really nice. And that gives me a reason to have that fuchsia in there of the fuchsia and the, the fruit rather. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit with my brush. And if I want like a little stronger color anywhere, like anywhere we had some shadows, I, I like to do that over a palette or over like not over my painting be, unless I want spatters because you can get spatters that way really easily. So I just bring my brush over to my my palette area to do that. Oh, I like that kind of tone on tone. That was a little strong. Oh, I think that gives it kind of a really nice, uh, a nice feel. Plus, that kind of fuchsia, almost purpley color, will set off the, um, the vase a little bit. So I'm going to go in here and liquefy those darks that we just put in there with the fuchsia and see how that makes that look. I think it's giving it a little bit stronger of a color. Of course, we won't really know for sure until it's completely dry. I'm just going to fade it into the other colors that we have there. They should be pretty 
dissolved. And let's see. I think I will go in with a little more poppy red. And maybe a little bit of the orange. And I'm gonna follow up with a little more yellow. Cause I just felt like that these weren't as intense as I wanted them to be. Now I do have some ink tense blocks that um, you can get the any of these products open stock, which means you can buy them individually. And I bought a three pack. I just bought three of the white ones because I go through them pretty quickly. I like to use them in lieu of gouache because they're uh, they're so opaque. And um, I plan on using some of them here in this painting. I do see I've got like a little bit of that purple color on the bowl there, so I'm going to go ahead and. Um, and add that, but I am going to use my brush to do that because I don't want to, I don't want to get too much there. So that's a part of this lesson is also looking for those undertones, the subtle varieties of color and the shifts of color that you might see. I'm even seeing some turquoisey color in there, which remember we put in um, we put in dry, but I think we could actually do some of that technique with that that uh, teal. I think it's called teal green, kind of like a beautiful turquoise color. I'm seeing that in there and a little bit there on the on the edge. Now I am also noticing that as we build up the layers of our ink tents that we've lost a little bit of some of the really dark blacks as well. So we may want to go in and think about redefining some of the blacks when we go in and we add our highlights, but we want to let this dry first and um, then we can come in and do those final touches. It does look pretty good just the way it is now too. So, you know, don't be afraid to put it away for a day or two if you're not sure whether you want to add more to it. This is an intense block. This is a the white, the antique white color. And I'm going to see direct to paper how this will perform. You can see it actually does leave us a nice, you know, nice um, amount of color there. Kind of like it would be like using chalk. You can put in those brighter highlights that you may have missed. And you can also do that with a wet brush and just pick up the, the pigment from this with a wet brush. All right, I am going to liquefy some of these a little bit because they are a little harsh. And they do kind of disappear when you add water, but they when, don't judge what they look like until they've completely dried because they'll return a little bit. This white is pretty neutral, I meaning it doesn't go really cold on you. It doesn't, uh, you know, sometimes if you have white gouache or white color pencil or even a white gel pen, sometimes it'll just look a little, the color temperature will look a little cold. And if you're just doing little details, that would be a good time to give a round brush a try. Um, because you're not trying to push around a lot of paint and what you can do is just pick up your pigment like that from the stick.
And I do recommend a gold, uh, like a Taclon brush or a nylon brush for this as well, just because you're going to get um, the the control that you want. You're probably not trying to cover a really large area with a white. You're probably just trying to put a little bit of highlight in. take a little bit to get the right consistency. Inktense blocks do, they are a little thirsty, they will grab your grab your water. Sometimes I'll tap it out with my finger if I want to get like a frosted effect. And you can mix that, like if it's too harsh you can mix it with the Inktense pencil of your color of your choice on the um, on the palette, and get exactly what you want. I'm gonna blend that out a little bit because that's not a really bright highlight. Just kind of like a bounced, and a bounced highlight, bounced off the table back onto the bowl. Getting a little turquoise on my intense block there. I must have had some that wasn't completely liquefied. I will warn you though, it's really easy to get carried away with the highlights, so um, so just take it easy with them. Now I've got to really let that dry before I determine whether that's enough or not because, um, you know, that as they dry they're going to appear more opaque and more, more white. Now I'm going to take the black again and I'm just going to see like if there's any areas where maybe I didn't get a really good edge or I didn't keep it dark enough and I'm just going to go in and and redefine any of those areas where I feel like, yeah, it looks a little incomplete. Sometimes you end up with a gap, you know, like, oh, I didn't fill that in very well, or what have you. And this is the time you can go in and adjust and fix that. I might mix in, um, some blue and turquoise, I'm sorry, blue and fuchsia. The sea blue and the fuchsia here, because I think that'll give the black a little bit more interest. And I do think I need a little bit of definition on my nectarines. I love about these ink tents products is that they're so versatile and your picture is not done until you're happy with it. You can keep altering it until you like how it's come out. And sometimes like you, you hit the point where it's like, yeah, whatever you do isn't going to make it better. You've overworked it. I feel like you have a much more of a, um, you have many more maybe undo buttons moments or you just have more more chances to add to it and not end up in trouble because every layer just kind of locks itself down. And you don't have to you don't have to liquefy. Like if you're on this last layer and you're like, I really like the texture of this, I like the color saturation, I you know, and you're happy with it, you maybe you like the texture you've built up on these nectarines and you don't want to dilute them, 
you don't have to. Just keep in mind if this thing gets wet, then then those colors could could migrate. But with any work on paper, the best practice is to mat it and frame it under glass anyway. So you know if you're just loving that texture there, and you don't want to you don't want to do anything else to it, you want to leave it almost like a colored pencil, then leave it. There's there's no rule saying you have to. Sometimes you get to a point where um, you've got, it usually doesn't happen with the ink tents because each layer kind of locks down as you add water, but you might get to a point where you're like, gee, I really like the finish of this. It's got a really nice texture to it. It's nice. I've already blended it out really smooth just by coloring with the pencil. I don't think I want to add more to it. I don't think I want to add water and risk everything getting kind of muddy or mixed up. That's fine. Don't. Leave it the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That's totally up to you. Or you can decide that you just want to liquefy some areas, but not all of them. That's totally up to you. I think this is looking nice adding the dry color that I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to liquefy it. It's looking pretty cool. I also think that I want a little bit of this green coming over onto the vase here. I might liquefy that, but I'm not sure. It depends on how smooth my pencil looks. It's such a wonderful medium to explore with and to play with. Oh, also, I did want to mention, if you've been recently picking up paint from the tip of a pencil and then you go into color with it, you may end up with like uneven applications of color and all, that won't blend out well. So if I had the tip of that was wet and I went to color in, I might get like a big chunk of color coming off because it was wet and it was ready to just kind of break off or release unequally. So just kind of keep that in mind too. I wouldn't necessarily go back and forth doing that unless you're sure, unless you want to take the risk or you're sure that it's dry. I think a little of that fuchsia up there would look good too. Because there is a really nice red glow in there and I think I need some of that fuchsia. Maybe add a little bit of water into the, into where I added the, uh, the color and the shadows. But honestly, for the most part, I think I'm kind of liking the textures there. Also keep in mind if you're going to add a lot of water and keep going back and forth, you want to color, you want to make sure your paper can handle it. I've used ink tents on tons of different pro different papers, but if I'm going to be, you know, blending a lot, rewetting a lot, I will try and find a nice quality watercolor paper that can take it, you know, that can take all that um that layering and that scrubbing and and what have you. I couldn't resist. I had to liquefy this. Oh, that really made that fuchsia pop, didn't it? <laughs> not sure if that was a good idea or not, but that's why we experiment. Never be so precious about your, your work that you are afraid to experiment. Oh, I like that. That's a pretty color, isn't it? Tone down that highlight. That's a little bright. I think I want my brightest highlights on the nectarines and on the vase. I 
think I liquefied that already. And I did want to liquefy that little bit of turquoise that I put in there. Oh, my brush is too wet. Just want to gently gently integrate it. And if it seems like it's too much, just, just wipe your brush off and pick some of it up while it's wet. Once it dries, it's there for good. And I think I might put a little bit of yellow on top of the highlight up there. That just seems a little bit too bright. And that seems a little bright as well. And I will just very gently liquefy it. I want it to be, I want it to stay lighter underneath, but I don't want really, really bright. And I'm just deciding how much highlight I want there. All right, I think that I'm happy with that. I hope that you give this a try, whether you use this reference photo or you use a photo they've taken yourself or one that you have in your collection, because it is a really fun exercise. If you've got a like a magazine clipping or a photo in your collection you want to use, you can take a photo of it with your smartphone and you can desaturate it, and that will give you a grayscale image that you can work from if you're not 100% sure about the values. I really enjoy painting this with you today. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time time. Happy crafting!